Hey everyone. In today's video, we're going to be going over how to make a pure aura stacker with Spark. And by pure aura stacker, I mean dual wielding nebuluses and focusing on maximizing increased aura effectiveness as well as increased mana reservation efficiency. So we're going to be covering this in general, but we're also going to be going to be looking at my specific character, which is an Inquisitor Aura Stalker. My character is currently hitting for around 30 million DPS, and this doesn't count projectiles bouncing and hitting multiple times. So if you want to factor in a small boss arena where we're hitting the boss multiple times per cast, the damage can go up to 130 million. So we are hitting really hard. And as you can see, my defenses are not that bad. You could still consider this build to be glass cannon, I suppose, because it seems like the standard for not being squishy is simply throwing on an Aegis Aurora, and I'm not using that shield. However, thankfully, if you do want to be an absolute tank, you can easily th uh, throw on uh, Aegis Aurora. In fact, if you use Aegis Aurora, I do believe the build will become a little bit cheaper as well, so you know that is an option if you so choose. All right, so we are going to be looking at a path of building tree, that, which is exactly the same as the one I'm using on my character, and this tree will work perfectly fine for every single class in the game. So you could make a spark or a stacker on any class with any ascendancy at all. The reasoning behind this is that all the aura stacking components are self-contained outside of the ascendancy passives. And the way the tree is set up, it is close to every single starting point with the exception of ranger. With ranger, you can still make the tree work, although we would probably anoint something different and we would path into charisma, which is what I'm suggesting to anoint on the normal version of the tree. So with a little bit of tinkering, it will work with ranger and for all the other classes, it just works right out of the box. Um, now there are some winners as far as ascendancies go. For champion, you get to be a little bit tankier and you may be able to cheap out on your gear because this one actually does have some aura related, aura -related ascendancy passives. So this will lessen the load on our gear. However, we can, easily fit in all the aura stuff necessary on our gear. Then the second is Inquisitor, which I'm playing. Inquisitor gives us a lot of damage and regen. It's just an all around powerful class and it's meta for a reason right now. The third one I would recommend is Ascendant. Now Ascendant is good because it's very flexible and if you're an advanced player, you can cater your um, Ascendancy tree to uh, however you want to spe specifically uh, build your character. Now, as for all the other ascendancies, I don't really see a compelling reason to go outside of these top three choices. However, the tree will still function if you decide to be a little bit more adventurous, and I'm sure there are going to be tons of other valid choices as far as ascendancies go. All right, so... Right here on the right hand side is the passive tree we are going to be using. In this screenshot, you can see we path out of the Templar starting area because I'm rolling with Inquisitor. However, those five initial pathing points could be connected to the other starting um, class areas and just copy the tree identically. As for large clusters, these are simply damage cl damage clusters. And the reason we use these is to enable us for small passive nodes because the small clusters have introspection as they're notable. And this is crucial in order to make the build function. Now, this uh, screen also lists all of the must have uniques. So we're dual wielding Nebulous. And as I said earlier, you can opt to use one Nebulous, one Aegis Aurora, you know, that's preference. We use Ashes of the Stars. We use Melding of the Flesh. The most expensive item in the build is the Mage Blood. 
we have two Call of the Brotherhood rings, and we use Militant Faith in conjunction with Unnatural Instinct because they have a synergy that we will talk about soon. All right, so this is probably the most important part of this video, and it is the core fundamentals of aura stacking. I'm just going to spend a few minutes going over this because if you want to play an aura stacker, I think you just need to understand how these three pieces fit together because after you successfully have these three parts of your build, you can just throw on like any auras you want, just throw on any other pieces of gear you want. You will still have an aura stacker, but you need to have these three pieces together or else it will not be an aura stacker. Okay, so first you need to raise your purity gem to level 23. The reason we need to hit level 23 is because that's the breakpoint where the purity will give us plus five max res. Now, the second thing we need to do is increase our aura effectiveness by 200%. When we increase it by 200%, we're essentially multiplying the effectiveness by three. So our plus five max res will turn into plus 15 max res and it will instantly cap whatever purity we have chosen. And the third piece of the puzzle is melding of the flesh. Now, this will transform all of our max reses to 90%. And this is really good for defense, but it is also really good for offense because it is how we squeeze out the damage from dual wielding and nebulous. All right, so level 23 purity gem. We're gonna start off by buying a level 23 for purity of lightning, ice, or fire. It doesn't really matter which you choose. However, if you want to use the Aegis Aurora shield, obviously you're gonna choose ice because the Aegis Aurora gives you plus five to cold resist. So then you won't have to actually buff your purity all the way. Now, since we're using Ashes of the Stars, this gives plus one to level of all spell skill gems and that includes purities. So we're at 22 instantly. We just have to get plus one more level. There are a few ways to get this. I've just listed the two most common. The first one is fossil crafting a body armor. If you use faceted plus corroded plus, funda plus fundamental in a three socket resonator, you have the possibility of getting plus one to level of socketed intelligence gems. Um, the advantage of this is ideally, we're gonna wanna put our purity in our body armor with five other auras and then an enlightened four. And uh, this just, uh, it works with that. Whereas the second option in the helmet where we craft plus one to AOE gems from the bench, this requires that the aura be in our helmet. So now the purity isn't gonna get the bonus from the enlightened four However, there's also an upside to going with the helmet route. And this is, if you put the purity in the helmet, you don't have to get this hard to get delve only mod, which means you could probably get a much better body armor because it's pretty easy to buy a really good body armor or craft a really good body armor if you don't have to worry about getting this specific mod on it. But if you have to roll these three expensive fossils, and it's the only way to get this mod, it starts to become really hard to get a perfect chest with like the other stats being good. So um, yeah, it's really just a personal call which way to go. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. All right, so now on to increasing aura effect to 200%. Here's a list of all the different things we need to do to hit that 200% threshold. First of all, the passive tree gives us 66% increased effect of non-cursed auras. And it also gives us the stat, auras have 15% increased effect on you from a mastery. Now, if we were an aura bot, that second stat wouldn't be useful. But since we're an aura stacker instead of an aura bot, these two stats are exactly the same, so we can just add them together. So for the body armor, 
you want to get some Eldritch Implicits. For Eater of Worlds, you're going to get 30% increased effect of purity of whichever one you chose. And then for the Searing Exarch, you want to get 14% increased effect of non-cursed auras. Now, these are also additive. Obviously, the 30% for the purity will only affect your purity, whereas the Searing Exarch one will affect all of your auras. We're an aura stacker, so we're going to have tons of different auras. Now, Militant Faith and Unnatural Instinct will give us 21% increased effect of non-cursed auras. And on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see a red box that's circling the two stats we want on the Militant Faith. Now, this Militant Faith isn't too cheap because we actually, well, we, we need to get the increased effect of non-cursed auras per 10 devotion because that is what's giving us the 21% increased effect. However, we also want to get, or we want to ideally get the reduced mana cost of skills, because if we can reduce the cost of our spark to zero, we can reserve 100% of our mana, which is very strong for an aura stacker. You don't want to be spending mana. You want to have all your mana reserved. So that might run you around uh I don't know, 5 to 10x. You can't pick a random militant faith. Just keep that in mind. And the reason unnatural instinct synergizes with this is because unnatural instinct allocates a ton of small passives, like all this, the passives in the AoE. And we put the unnatural instinct close to the militant faith so that we are getting devotion from all of these uh, passives that are allocated through unnatural instinct. So that gives us a total of the 210 devotion we need. Now, the fourth way to get the aura effect is through a synthesized helmet implicit. So you're just going to have to buy this probably or run a lot of um, synthesis maps until you find one. And it's a uh, 15% increased effect of non-cursed auras. Now, the last 40% is gotten through four small cluster jewels. Uh, these all have to have the notable introspection. Each introspection gives us 10% uh, for auras have 10% increased effect on you. So that this is uh, just the core of an aura stacker is just buffing your aura effect. And this is how we hit the 200%. All right, now on to part three. It is using melding of the flesh to translate into high DPS. So my build uses double nebulous to fully leverage this. If you're gonna go for the Aegis Aurora, you aren't gonna have as much of a leverage on your DPS, but it'll probably still be fine. Like my damage is just way overkill, I suppose. So yeah, two nebulous with two Call of the Brotherhood Rings. So when we have 90 max res, the nebuluses will give us 300% increased lightning damage and 300% increased cold damage. In a spark, we do 100% lightning damage unless we equip, equip Call of the Brotherhood, which converts 96% of our lightning damage to cold damage. But we're still getting the increased lightning damage because now we're just double dipping and we're getting the lightning damage and the increased cold damage. So we're getting a total 600% increased damage and the nebuluses are also giving us 40% increased cast speed. And if we buy expensive nebulus, the implicits can do a lot of extra damage as well. I'm currently running a uh, nebulus that only costs around three exalted orbs. Mine have critical strike multiplier in the implicit. If you want a better nebulous, you can spend approximately 30 exalted orbs, and that will give you the implicit 10% uh, chance to do double damage with spells, which is just like a 10% more damage multiplier, basically. And that would be per nebulous, so that would be like 20% more damage. Now, I guess we can draw some conclusions for what I just talked about. So, um, for the increasing aura effect to 200%, if you use the Aegis Aurora, 
you would only have to increase your aura effect to by 100% because you don't need your purity of ice to give you plus 15. You only need it to give you plus 10 because the Aegis Aurora is giving you plus five, which means you're able to cut out a full 100% aura effect. Um, that will make the build significantly cheaper. However, there is the obvious downside that you just flat out want aura effect when you're an aura stacker because you have all these auras and every single aura is either giving you a lot of damage or a lot of defensiveness. So if you're cutting 100% aura effect, you are losing a lot of damage and you're losing a lot of defense. So just keep in mind if you're deciding to go the Aegis Aurora route, you are no longer a pure aura stacker, you're sort of a hybrid aura stacker. However, Aegis Aurora is incredibly broken and this is probably actually the stronger build. So that would be one way to apply this knowledge to the current patch. If Aegis Aurora gets nerfed next patch, maybe uh, that would no longer be a valid option. But right now it is something to consider. So since we've gone over the fundamentals together, this passive tree should innately make sense to you guys. So I don't want to spend too much time going over it, but we might as well spend a couple minutes. My first point of interest is the Venn diagram between militant faith and unnatural instinct. So everything in the middle is going to count for devotion because even if they're unallocated, unnatural instinct counts them as allocated. So right now we have 210 devotion, which is how much we need. If we take off a natural instinct, drops down to 125. So this is the uh, interesting synergy between these two. As for starting locations, this is coming out of Templar. It takes five points to connect to the tree and it should take five points to connect anywhere. For example, which one, two, three, four, five, shadow one, two, three, four, five, um, down here, duelist, one, two, three, four, five. And over here, one, two, three, four, five. And if you wanted to play on a ranger, it would take more. And you'd have to path like this, which in turn would mean we'd go for charisma and we get this jewel socket. And we would just unspec all of this and anoint champion of the cause. All right. As for the small clusters, I'm using small passives have 35% increased effect, although you could get away with 25% increased effect. It's a bit cheaper. It just depends on your mana reservation situation. You'll have to, to do the math. The main importance on these is having introspection on the end of each one. Now, looking at the skills, I'm personally running my purity on my body armor because I have the plus one intelligence on my body armor. So we've got the six, uh, got the six auras in here. Now, some of these alt qualities, you know, you can just test by taking them off, putting them back on. Like for example, Determination Divergent brings our armor up from 56 to 76, and that's because we're running Grace. But if you were doing the hybrid version where you're only running one Nebulous and you're using the um, Aegis Aurora, you might not be able to fit Grace in here. So then this alt quality becomes less useful. Um, you can just browse all of these gems yourself and just toggle the qualities to see what they do. Like, I don't really want to explain them all. In general, because we're running Ashes, you know, there's even more benefit to various alt qualities, but, uh, you know, some are more important than others. So we're really... Uh, socket starved which is why wrath is just a corruption on my uh call of the brotherhood because i want i had 
I couldn't fit all the auras I wanted in my gems, so we have some auras on our gear. We're going to end this video on a PSA that you do not need to make an aura stacker to make a successful spark character. In fact, for 99% of you guys, just regular spark on Inquisitor is going to be more than fine. And maybe if you have a lead goal of farming up a headhunter and throwing it on, you're going to have like basically just as good of a time as if you were to dump in the insane amounts of currency to make a spark aura stacker. So let me just quickly go over the cost you can expect to incur if you do want to go this build, just to put this in perspective. So I'm running a Nebulous with Global Critical Strike Multiplier. These costs run 3x, so that's 6 Exalted Orbs right there. The Helmet, 15% increased effect of non-cursed auras. Probably expect to pay around 5 Exalts right there. Ashes, I don't know what this goes for, somewhere between 40 and 50 X, I'd guess. The body armor, plus one to level of socket in intelligence gems. If you don't want to craft this yourself, it's probably going to cost around 10 to 30 exalted orbs, depending on how good you want it to be. However, just keep in mind, you can get the plus one to AOE gems in the helmet, and this is free, so you don't need to buy an expensive body armor. The mage blood obviously is very expensive. This is, what is that, like 180x? I'm not too sure. And for spark gloves, because we're putting our spark in our gloves, this will run you probably baseline 20x if you just want to get a somewhat decent glove. This is like the minimum you can spend. My gloves are probably worth somewhere between 50 to 80x. Um, yeah, these are quite expensive. And then for boots, obviously I just have a very expensive pair of boots that have elevated tailwind, elevated uh, onslaught, cannot be chilled, elusive effect. These will cost you around maybe 30 to 40 X, but this is, uh, I'm just throwing it on because I have the currency. You don't, you don't need this. I forgot to mention the cost of all the jewels, uh, the small clusters, if you want 25% increased effect, those run about 5x each. If you want 35% effect, it's closer to 15x each. You have to buy natural instinct, that's not cheap. Militant faith isn't cheap. And also all the alt quality gems do add up as well, so there are a lot more costs than simply the gear on your character. Anyways, uh, that wraps up the video. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. This was more of just an educational type video than me expecting you guys to actually play the build I'm playing. Uh, but you know, I, I hope you got something out of it. And I'll let this video run. It's just me doing a map. And you guys can close out whenever you want. All right, I hope you guys are having a nice league and I will see you in the next one. Time to go.